a factual conversation about Zika. Zika virus, that's been in the news almost every week. But what are the facts behind the disease? And what can we do to protect ourselves? Is there really anything to be concerned about living in Central Florida? My guest today is Dr. Paul Ramey with the Florida Department of Health. Dr. Ramey is the Director for Disease Control. Doctor, with the Zika virus, for the uninitiated, what is it? The Zika virus has been around for a long time. It was actually first described about 60 years ago in Africa. Mm -hmm. It was named after the Zika forest in Uganda where it was actually discovered. There were a few case reports over the years, but nothing really significant for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then in the early part of this century, there were a couple outbreaks in the Pacific Islands, one on the island of Yap and another in French Polynesia. This is where we first saw it affect a wider swath of the population. Mm -hmm. um, since then, in the last year, it has resurfaced for the first time here in the Americas. It had never really been described here in the Western Hemisphere prior to last year when we saw a significant outbreak occurring in Brazil. The outbreak eventually has spread throughout South America and Central America and now is in the Caribbean um, and has affected tens of thousands of people. Now that is south of here, that's like you said South America, those are the Caribbean islands. Th what is the status of this virus here in Florida? Okay, one of the concerns that we have with mosquito-borne illnesses like Zika virus, which is predominantly spread by mosquitoes, is that <clears throat> even if we don't have them here in the United States, is that travelers to areas where they do have the disease can bring this back with them. And while their blood still has the virus in it, which is about five to seven days, they can infect a mosquito which could spread it to somebody else. So the fact that we're seeing it in the Caribbean is a concern because we do have a significant number of travelers, especially here in the state of Florida, that come here from Puerto Rico, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and other places. Um, so there is the potential for the disease to spread here in the state of Florida. Right now, we have seen over 400 cases of imported Zika virus throughout the state. Uh, in Volusia County, we've actually reported seven. So we have seen a few cases here that have been brought in from outside of the country. Um, with this, the concern is that the mosquitoes that spread the disease, the Aedes aegypti specifically, although Aedes albopictus is a secondary vector, we do have those here in the state of Florida and in Volusia County. So the concern is that they could spread the disease from an infected person to a non-infected person. In fact, we have seen that now in the Miami area. There is a small outbreak that is continuing to go on in the Wynwood area of Miami. It's about a one square mile uh, area in which there has been local transmission. Somebody from came in with the disease from outside the country, brought it into the area. The Aedes aegypti mosquitoes there bit that person and then they have spread it to several other people. The current numbers in that particular outbreak are about 25, um, but they've tested around 500 people looking for the potential of spread. If we do see a locally acquired case or what we believe it is, typically what we would do is go out and try and canvas the area around where the person lives to see if anybody else might be infected. If we don't find any other infections, then we assume that local spread has stopped with that particular case. If we do find other cases, then you expand out the area that you're looking to try and find those. When we do get a case of Zika virus, whether it's imported or locally acquired, we do contact the mosquito control people. Their goal is to go out to the place of residence and or work or wherever the person has been to identify areas where mosquitoes might be breeding and could transmit the virus. Our goal is, as anything else, to try and decrease the risk of local transmission and prevent it, if at all possible. Let people know this isn't something new. Uh, because it's it's transmitted the same way like I would say like like malaria or other mosquito borne diseases where an infected person is bitten by the mosquito the mosquito then carries the uh, disease to another person yes there are, are 
quite a few uh, mosquito-borne illnesses, literally mm -hmm. hundreds of these out there. Luckily for us, we don't have very many here in the United States or in the state of Florida. They're pretty rare here, which is a good thing for us. Mm -hmm. you know, the ones that we're most concerned <clears throat> about are the ones spread by the 80s mosquitoes, such as um, Zika, chikungunya, and dengue, um, which we have seen imported cases of dengue and chikungunya in the last couple of years. Um, those are spread by Aedes. It is somebody that has a disease in their blood, is bitten by a mosquito, it goes through a developmental process in the mosquito of about a week, and then the mosquito bites somebody who doesn't, and that's how it's spread. Other mosquito-borne diseases that we're concerned about on a regular basis are West Nile virus, St. Louis encephalitis, Eastern equine encephalitis. Mm -hmm. The difference with these particular illnesses is that birds are part of their life cycle. And so because the bird is there, we will virtually never be able to eliminate it from the environment. Um, but the advantage we have with that is that we do have sentinel chicken flocks here throughout the state of Florida and we do have some here in Volusia County and we can monitor those mm -hmm. birds to see if the virus is circulating in the area. Now, mosquito-borne, that's one way to, uh, to contract Zika. Is there, there are other ways as well, correct? Correct. Um, the mosquito is the predominant vector for the disease. It's by far the most common way people can get it. But we have found that it can also be transmitted sexually, which was somewhat of a surprise, but you know, it could happen. The concern is that if you have um, a person that comes back with the disease, that they could actually spread it sexually to their partner, even if there's no mosquitoes present. One of the things they found is that they have found the virus in semen for as long as 90 days after infection. So that's one of the reasons why the CDC has recommended that if a, a man goes to one of the affected areas and they are symptomatic is that they wait at least six months prior uh, to having unprotected sex with a, uh, a woman who's trying mm -hmm. to become pregnant. Um, the other issue with the Zika virus that makes this different from other mosquito-borne illnesses is the potential for transmission to a baby in the womb. This is the part of the infection that causes the, res the response that you know, people are concerned with because it has been linked to fetal abnormalities, specifically microcephaly, which is an abnormal formation of the brain in the developing fetus. There's still way more that we don't know about this than that we do know. So we're still doing the research mm -hmm. necessary. The CDC and the state of Florida have registries going where they're keeping track of women that have had the disease that are pregnant to monitor the outcome of their infants. And as that information becomes available, the CDC will release that. But for right now, the biggest concern is for mm -hmm. pregnant women acquiring <clears throat> the disease and why the travel advisories were issued to try and limit the possibility that pregnant women would get infected with the virus. Now, if, how would somebody know if they've been infected? Uh, granted, you go outside in the evening and we live in Florida, it's almost a given that you get bit. <laughs> um, with the Zika virus itself, it's interesting because the disease it causes is really fairly benign. The four hallmark signs are fever, rash, conjunctivitis and joint pain. But all of these are relatively mild and it might be mistaken for you know, a, a small case of the flu. The symptoms last at most five to seven days and then you're over it. And the other part with Zika virus is that only about 20% of the people actually have any symptoms at all. So you may be exposed to it mm -hmm. and never know you even have the disease. If someone suspects that they do have it, if they are symptomatic and have traveled to an area where we have local spread, then we can detect it through blood tests and or urine testing. What they do is they test, take a blood sample, they will check the blood to see uh, the virus only sticks around for about seven days. So after mm -hmm. that, it would no longer be present there. It actually sticks around in the urine for about two weeks. So you could detect it in the urine mm -hmm. up to two weeks after the symptoms have started to occur. The insect repellents that are approved by the FDA mm -hmm. are safe to use in pregnant women. And we want to emphasize that because they should be protecting themselves from mm -hmm. mosquito bites if they're in an area where active transmission is occurring. Um, now, the one thing with the repellents is if you're looking at little kids, 
you do have to pay attention to the labels. Some of them can be used on young children, others mm -hmm. can't. So you need to make sure you're reading the, lab, uh, the label carefully. Um, one comment on mm -hmm. the pregnant women is, one of the things that the CDC is trying to look at is what is the, say, percentage of people that would have birth defects that are infected with the virus. They don't know. They don't think the number is 100%. So simply being exposed to the virus or mm -hmm. even catching the disease does not mean that you're going to have a deformed baby. And what's recommended is that they undergo serial ultrasounds every three to four weeks to monitor mm -hmm. the status. And it's quite possible the baby could be born perfectly normal in fact, it's probably more likely than not. So it's not 100% mm -hmm. by any stretch that they're going to have this, but monitoring the progression yeah. is what's recommended at this time. You need basically three things for disease to spread. You have to have the agent of the disease, whether it's a virus, bacteria, parasite, present. Then you have to have a means for that agent to get to a susceptible person, which is the third thing. So when you look at the state of Florida, the source of infection has to be a person coming back from the affected areas. When you look at where we are seeing those people, um, it's, as I said, we've had almost 500 imported cases. A predominant number of those do occur in southeast Florida, which is because that's where most of the travelers come from. So that's where you would expect the biggest risk because that's where we have the most virus. We also have fairly high numbers in Orange County, which again, with the Orlando area, you would, it would not be unexpected. Other parts of the state do not have the numbers of travelers coming in who are potentially infected, so they are at much lower risk. The other thing that, that you need to have this spread is the Aedes aegypti mosquito. And that's found in various numbers throughout the state, but it's at much higher numbers in the southern part of the state because it, it is a cold intolerant mosquito, meaning it doesn't survive very well in areas that get you know, cold in the winter. So you would expect it to be much more prominent in the southern part of the state. So again, the more mosquitoes, the more risk of spread. The last thing that you have to have to get the mosquito spread is the susceptible person. Now, all of us do not have, any, pretty much all of us are not immune to Zika virus, so we all are <coughs> susceptible from an immunologic standpoint, but you have to be exposed to a mosquito. So you can decrease that susceptibility by one, wearing uh, proper clothing, repellent, et cetera, when you go outside. But the other thing that protects us from mosquito-borne diseases here in the United States compared to other parts of the world is the fact that air conditioning is almost ubiquitous here in the mm -hmm. state of Florida. And so most people in the summer spend most of the time in air conditioning, or even if they don't have air conditioning, the windows have good screens on them, which keeps the mosquitoes out of the house, decreases the chance of getting infected. In order to better understand about the primary transmission source for Zika, we visited Volusia County Mosquito Control. The two species, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, look fairly nondescript, almost benign, with names larger than the actual insect. But it's vitally important that we know where these mosquitoes live, their feeding habits, and most critical, how to reduce their population and potentially eliminate their threat of spreading the Zika virus. Now, with the mosquitoes that carry the Zika virus, what types are they? Well, those are two, and um, those are, are Aedes aegypti, that's mm -hmm. the yellow fever mosquito. The okay. other is Aedes albopictus, that's the Asian tiger mosquito. Mm -hmm. Aedes aegypti is the primary vector of Zika, as well as dengue or chikungunya. Aedes albopictus is secondary vector. Both are produced in containers. Both do take blood meals. Okay, now when you say container, that is any type of standing water. It's not a swamp, it's not a river, it's not a pond, correct? That's right. Uh, these two mosquitoes are specific to the water that's in containers. That container can be an upright wheelbarrow, it can be a saucer under a plant, it can be a bird bath, a clogged gutter, it can be something as small as a bottle cap or as large as a 55 gallon drum. Now, when they lay their eggs, do they, does it do they actually lay them in the water or how did uh, how do they do this? No, many mosquitoes do lay their eggs directly on top of the water, but these two mosquitoes um, will lay their eggs just above the water line in that bird bath or in that tire. Mm -hmm. And when there is a rain, uh, the water level rises, it covers the eggs that mm -hmm. are already adhered to the side of the container, and the whole developmental prices, processes is off and running. Now with these two mosquitoes, their behavior is a little bit different 
from other mosquitoes? It is. Somebody said this uh, this summer, um, they had a, a very good metaphor. They said that these two mosquitoes were the, the cockroach of the mosquito world. That's a, a real yeah. good metaphor. Mm -hmm. They're right there uh, in and around your home. They're in the containers in your backyards, front yards, side yards. They are active during the day primarily, mm -hmm. as opposed to other mosquitoes that are active more at nighttime, mm -hmm. dusk and dawn. They don't fly very far, so the mosquitoes you produce in your backyard and your containers are going to bother you, and they're probably going to bother the neighbors on either side or in back of you. And they will enter the house, so not all mosquito species like to come into your house. Mm -hmm. These two mosquitoes like to come into your house, and they will do so if the door is open, if there's a, a torn screen, mm -hmm. uh, that type of situation. Now, in order to as like treat for these types of mosquitoes or to help prevent them. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the steps? I mean, one would be very obvious that you don't have any standing water. Yeah, we always uh, beat this drum. Uh, this mm -hmm. is a drum that, um, that we do beat every year. And uh, it's really a, a matter of personal responsibility for people to be going out and looking for those containers from late May to, to late October. That's the prime season for container mosquito production. As long as people go out to these containers once a week and tip them over, replenish them with fresh water if that's necessary in a bird bath, or just flush the water completely out and replace it with fresh water, or just get rid of the container that's not necessary, mm -hmm. not needed around the house anymore. But if they'll just do that once a week, that takes care of the situation. You get, uh like you're saying once a week is, the, I guess it's like the incubation period for the mosquito from It's egg. the developmental life cycle. Yeah. So from egg to an adult emerging from the pupil stage, roughly a week. Aedes aegypti um, has been around for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And this phenomenon of um, people returning to the United States infected with a disease is mm -hmm. nothing new. Um, again, the common name is the yellow fever mosquito. Yeah and people used to come to the United States um, sick with yellow fever, get mm -hmm. off of the boat along with Aedes aegypti, which was being produced in rain barrels on the ship. On the boat. Everybody gets off in a seaport, whether mm -hmm. it's New York City or Philadelphia or Jacksonville, and that's why we lost um, hundreds of people due to yellow fever epidemics in the 16, 17, and 1800s happens a lot quicker now. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. not on boats, they're on planes. So mm -hmm. somebody goes to Brazil, gets infected with Zika virus, comes back to Volusia County, but it's the same story. Yeah. And it's really the same mosquito. Mm -hmm. 80s albopictus is a mosquito that came to the United States, was first found in Houston, Texas, back in 1985. Okay. We think that it came to uh, Houston, Texas in used tires. We actually import Mm -hmm. used tires to the United States, but since 1985 it has spread throughout the United States. Wow. Well, what Ray's looking at are mosquitoes that have come in from our traps, mm -hmm. and at this point it's necessary to identify the mosquitoes two species. Uh, in this case, again, we're looking for Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. There are obvious differences between the two species and between all of the mosquito species that we have. So for instance, Aedes albopictus is, tends to be more black and white with a nice racing stripe on the top of the thorax. Okay. Aedes aegypti, a little more brown and white, and it doesn't have that nice racing stripe on the top. Okay, now are they about the same size? Or this one's larger For the than most the part, Aedes albopictus may be a little bit bigger, yeah. Mm -hmm. Size is one of those things that um, is is tough and to, um, to say as a defining characteristic. Just another question to ask with the mosquitoes, is there like a, a height that they typically don't go above or does that make much difference? Again, um, different mosquito species will feed at different heights. So one of the common terms that's used around here sometimes, again, in the context of those two mosquitoes, Aegypti and Albopictus, some people call them ankle biters. Yeah. because they do tend to bite, for the most part, below the knee. Mm -hmm. uh, other mosquito species will go up in the canopies of trees because they're more associated with feeding on birds. And there have been reports of mosquitoes being uh, pretty high up in the air, researchers that have done work on, on that. We do run uh, 
at least a half a dozen different types of mm -hmm. traps. Some we deploy or are in place to give us a cross section of the mm -hmm. different mosquito species that exist in an area as well as the population levels. And then some traps are specific to um, specific mosquito species in this case. So we have a trap, it's called a BG trap. Mm -hmm. It looks like a, a large um, white Chinese lantern yeah. shaped trap. And that, mis that trap with the attractant is, is really specific to the two mosquitoes that we're concerned about now in the context of, of Zika. So it uses an attractant inside that mimics, it's a synthetic uh, mimic of, of our skin, mm -hmm. and that's what's attractive uh, to those two mosquitoes. So essentially, there's a fan and a motor inside which help disperse the scent of that attractant while at the same time uh, sucking in any mosquitoes that get close enough because mm -hmm. they're interested in that yeah. attractant. This just happens to be um, our rig. This is mm -hmm. a, uh, a rain cover, mm -hmm. but ultimately you pull that off. This is this is yeah. the net that you saw in the laboratory. Okay, that's what holds the... Uh, that's where the mosquitoes mm -hmm. would be sucked into. And so we would put these out well, roughly around noon one day and pick it up roughly around noon the next day. Mm -hmm. And as you saw, the bag and the contents come back to the laboratory. Mm -hmm. Folks identify them to species. If they're one of those two species, then we keep them and have them tested for disease. Cool. That happens to be the attractant. Yeah. The battery that mm -hmm. runs the trap, and then and you the, see fan. the fan mm -hmm. down the center. Okay. Pretty effective. It is. It's a very good trap. Hasn't been around too awful long, less than 10 years, mm -hmm. but it works extremely well for the two species we're interested in. Now, uh, offhand, do you know about how many of the traps do you have? Uh, scattered throughout the county? Well, we have 55 sites, mm -hmm. um, so roughly 36, 37 of those sites are in the district, mm -hmm. and then the others are, are outside, it's dispersed around the west, west side. Every city in, uh, in the Volusia County, in Volusia County, mm -hmm. has at least three of these traps. Oh, okay. That's a pretty good representation then. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, this is a mosquito spray truck, and we see these pretty much almost every evening. Uh, the basic components and how does something like this operate? It's essentially um, a machine that will break up um, the fluid of the insecticide and we apply generally at about a half an ounce to an ounce of insecticide per acre. So if you think of it, we're breaking up a shot glass or a half a shot glass full of insecticide into tiny droplets, uh, many dozens of which could fit on the head of a needle dispersing them in the air and then uh, we're hoping that they will ultimately impinge on, impact a mosquito and that kills the mosquito. These trucks are focused on the mosquitoes that are active primarily right after dusk and up until about midnight. Okay. Now, somebody in a neighborhood where they feel that they're having a, an issue with mosquitoes and they want to uh, schedule a treatment, mm -hmm. what would, what's the typical process? Well, what they'll do is, um, if they're inside the district, um, they will contact us directly. Uh, if they are outside of the district, for instance, if they're in the west side in Deltona, uh, what they would do would be to contact their liaison. Their liaison, in turn, would contact us with a service request. Uh, and that liaison can do that either by phone or, or by email. We, in turn, must do surveillance. We must go to the area where um, the person is saying they have a mosquito problem and determine whether in fact it's a mosquito problem. Mm -hmm. um, and that's required by state statute, Florida state statute. So mm -hmm. we just don't go out and spray on a schedule. Um, we don't want to go out and spray biting midges or yeah. noceums or anything else. I mean, we are mosquito control. Mm -hmm. There have to be mosquitoes. There have to be mosquitoes of a, a certain population level. Yeah. And then we will schedule a ULV mission. Now this is for, like you said, a large area, but like say an individual, if they need to take care of themselves, you know, like a repellent, are, is there something that you guys would recommend, like say for an individual, if they, you know, they're going to be working in the yard? Yeah, absolutely. We always recommend a repellent that works. So, you know, there are all sorts of bright ideas or myths of, out there yeah. about how to keep mosquitoes away from you. Mm -hmm. We always say use the repellents that work. Mm -hmm. So the gold standard of repellents still uses DEET. Yeah. That's D like dog, E-E-T mm -hmm. as the active ingredient. Uh, but there are four or five other um, repellents that do work, 
have been rigorously tested and are recommended by um, the CDC, mm -hmm. the Centers for Disease Control, Consumer Reports, the World Health Organization. Um, people can access the, those sites and those repellents through us, through links mm -hmm. that we have at our website, or they can just Google CDC, Google mosquito repellents, yeah. and pick one that works. Now, if somebody wanted to get more information about what your office does, so that way they, they're more familiar, is there a website that they can go to? There is. If they'll just go to volusia.org, mm -hmm. um, look right on that services menu. It's a drop-down menu of uh, services provided by the county. You'll see mosquito control, and that will take people right to the, the web page. Um, there is a, a good wealth of information on that, so you'll get an overview of what it is that we do. Um, there will be sections, again, in drop-down menus where they can access disease information, repellent information, where they can access all of the insecticides that we use here, and they can actually view spray operations. So they can view a spray operation that would be um, set for tonight or spray operations going back two weeks. There are thousands of acres out there that have the potential to produce mosquitoes. So we utilize the helicopter to go around and look for mosquito production on the salt marsh. Mm -hmm. If it's necessary, we will aerially larvicide to those, to those bodies of standing water on the mm -hmm. salt marsh to eliminate those mosquitoes. If we have a severe infestation, uh, there's the potential to aerially adulticide a larger area than what a truck would be deployed against. We actually raise what are referred to as mosquito fish. It is a specific species of fish that looks almost exactly like a, a guppy, a female guppy, not mm -hmm. a fancy guppy, but um, we raise them in a hatchery and we do deploy them in, in certain situations. So we get calls about abandoned pools, green swimming pools. We will, mm -hmm. um, if there is mosquito production, we will put fish in there and um, you know, as long as there's something to eat, those, those fish will be fine. Uh, mm -hmm. We put them in, ornamental ponds that perhaps uh, are not maintained properly. And honestly, um, we do get the occasional call where if somebody just wants some mosquito fish, whether it's a, uh, a pond or an ornamental pond, and uh, we certainly are more than willing to, to give people um, some of those. For more information regarding the Zika virus and how to protect yourself and your family from the disease, visit the Department of Health website, www.floridahealth.gov. To find out more regarding mosquito control, go to www.volusia.org.